Our practice has been and always will be to use the absolute, infallible Word of God preserved in the authorized version of the King James Bible 1611 in the international language of English. Right, today we are going to see the way false teachers work. And it's important as born-again Christians to understand this because everywhere, all around us, we have false teachers, right? And the Lord Jesus Christ, in His words, they would be wolves in sheep's clothing. So we need to be careful about them, identify them, and reject them and their teachings, right? So it's important to look at what the Bible says about these false teachers and how they work to deceive born-again Christians. <clears throat> Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 and verse 18. Romans 16 verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. <clears throat> now in, <coughs> I'm sorry. In verse 17, <clears throat> Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them, he says. So, in verse 18, when he says that uh, these are they which serve their own belly, and they use good words and fair speeches, they deceive the simple, he's talking about those who are contrary to sound doctrine. <coughs> these are false teachers and they are contrary to uh, to sound doctrine right and in this context where Paul says that you know these are they which uh, cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned he's talking about the entire body of revelation right and that would be the Holy Scriptures especially referring to the New Testament so you have a lot of these false teachers who use the Bible but they pervert the words of the scripture to teach what they want to teach. Right? So these are false teachers and uh, they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, he says. Now these come in and cause divisions. Right? Now you might be wondering, right? In other Bible studies, we emphasize the importance of division. And we emphasize the fact that God is the great divider. In the Bible, that's what you read about God. He divides. He divides. <clears throat> and uh, now it says that you need to mark those which cause divisions. You see, the divisions that Paul is talking about here are divisions which are contrary to sound doctrine. In other words, when you have a church which is, uh, you know, teaching sound doctrine and the believers are growing in the Lord Jesus Christ, living for the Lord, right? They are witnessing, winning souls, discipling them. That's a good church, which believes the King James Bible, right? That's the most important thing. And someone comes in and tries to bring in a new doctrine, which is contrary to that which uh, is being taught, right? Most of the times they would come in and say, how can your pastor say that the King James Bible is the perfect, preserved word of God? That's heresy, they would say. And they would take a bunch of people with them. Another would come and say, how is it that your pastor puts this emphasis on rightly dividing the word of truth? And in so doing, right, he teaches false uh, doctrines. So they take a bunch and go away. You'll have Calvinists coming and you'll have hyper-dispensationalists coming in, right? All sorts of cults coming in, trying to bring division in that Bible-believing local church. You are not called to be nice to such people, you see. The Lord never said, oh, be loving, united, or, you know, just let them be in fellowship with you. No, he says, mark them and avoid them. You see that? That's... The attitude a born-again Christian should have towards a false teacher. But uh, that's not what you see in most churches today. They say, oh, we need to be loving towards each other, right? Forgiving. And it's all right, you know, if he believes something else and I believe something else, it's all right. 
It's all right, you know, that he's influencing other people in the local church. <clears throat> it's very sad. But you see, these false teachers are contrary to sound doctrine and they divide a good Bible-believing Baptist church. And these are the kind of people you need to mark and avoid. Look at that. He says you need to avoid them. You don't have to fellowship with them. You don't have to be nice to these people and say it's all right. Kick them out. Kick them out of your local church. That's what you need to do. You cannot tolerate this. Look at uh, what John says in 2 John chapter, uh, you know, there's only one chapter there. 2 John <clears throat> verses 10 and 11. 2 John verses 10 and 11. Uh, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Do not even say hello to that fellow. You don't have to have any fellowship with such people. Don't invite them into your homes. Right? Especially if the local church has kicked them out. Right? If the local church has barred them from fellowshipping with God's people in that local church, you don't go out of the way and say, oh, I feel sad for this person. I'll invite him home. Maybe I'll win him over. No, most probably he will win you over to his false doctrines. That's why God says, do not even bid him Godspeed, right? Do not invite them <clears throat> into your homes. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So you must be very careful of these false teachers. Do not fellowship with them. Do not allow them to come into your homes. We're going to see what they do sometimes when they enter the homes of Christians. All right. So the thing that we need to note going back to Romans chapter 16 and verse 18 are these words. It says, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So. The first part says that, you know, these false teachers are those who are contrary to sound doctrine. You need to avoid them because they cause divisions among God's people who uh, believe the Bible and rightly divide the word of truth. You need to avoid such people. Right. And uh, what they do is uh, they serve their own bellies. You're going to see a little more about that later. But again, what I want you to look at is. This part of that verse which says, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Good words and fair speeches, that's what they use. They're very eloquent, you see, when they speak. They know how to woo a crowd. They know how to attract people. They know how to win people over to their uh, you know, uh, opinion. And they know how to deceive the hearts of the simple. And in order to do that, they use good words and fair speeches. In other words, you know, they don't preach. They don't preach the book. When they speak, it would be like they're giving a motivational speech, right? Trying to encourage you think, oh, look how positively he's speaking. Look how he's trying to lift me up, how he's trying to encourage me. He's not trying to do any of those things. He's trying to reach into your pocket, you see. That's what he's trying to do. And he's just like the devil. Look at what the devil says when he appears the first time in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. He comes to speak to Eve. Right? And look at what he says. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, he spoke to the woman. What did he say? What did he say? Did he say something that would disturb Eve? Something that would put a doubt in the mind of Eve, uh, you know, about what he is saying? No. He came to her with a very positive attitude, right? He said, Yea, had God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Look at the word yea. The word yea is positive. That's the word of the, uh, the devil, right? Positive. Positive speech. He says, Yea, had God said. 
He's trying to put a doubt in Eve's minds about the words of God. Right? So that Eve would not have any suspicion about the motives of the serpent. He uses a positive word, yea, he says. That's how these false teachers are. Right? By the way, there in Genesis 3, the way the devil worked with Eve is exactly the same way right, in which these higher critics deal with the words of God. And all the new versions are the result of these higher critics uh, uh, doubting what God has said in this book. Right? Yea, had God said. That's uh, the basis from which they operate. Yea, had God said. So they say, no, God had not said. We will tell you what God has said. The King James Bible is archaic, it's old-fashioned, it's gone out of fashion. Throw it out. It may be good for language, but it's not true to the original Greek and Hebrew, they say. All positive, right? About how they know what God has said. So you have to be careful because that's uh, the way these false teachers operate. Right? They give motivational speeches, positive talk. Right? Like you hear people like Joel Austin, for example. You would never see him preach the Bible. If his life was dependent on it, he would not preach the Bible. He would give you motivational talks to lift your spirits up, to make you feel happy, to make you forget your problems, give you false promises, maybe even give you some practical tips about how you can change your life and how you can prosper and earn more money. All that because ultimately he knows you would give him, right, for giving you that motivational speech, positive speech, motivational speech. That's what it is. Good words and fair speeches, you see. All positive, nothing negative. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. We'll read verses 15 through 17. Jeremiah 23 verses 15 through 17. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood, and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. You see the positivity there? That they, they teach peace. They say peace. To whom? To those who despise the Lord. To those who despise the Lord. Right, look at that. And everyone that walks after the imagination of his own heart, to them they say, no evil shall come upon you. Right, no evil. You'll never, uh, you'll never hear these false teachers preach about the evil in the lives of people. The sins of people. They would never do that. They would never ever do that. And we have a generation of Christians who do not have any clue as to what real biblical preaching is all about. They have no clue. So they hear these false teachers preach these smooth, right, speeches dripping with butter and honey. And they think, oh, what wonderful preaching. And when they hear a real Bible believer preach against their sins, preach hellfire and damnation, Right? Preach the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial and resurrection. They get offended. They say, what kind of preaching is this? This fellow is a mean guy. I don't want to listen to him. What do they want? They want all yay, positive things. They want to hear about peace when there is no peace. They want to hear the preacher say, no evil shall come upon you. Irrespective of how wickedly they are living their lives. 
This is how these false teachers operate, right? It's their speech. You can identify them by their speech. False teachers. They are the ones using good words and fair speeches. Look at uh, how the Bible has so much to talk about this. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the uh, lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. You see that all these things the Bible calls uh, great swelling words. I'm going to give you an example of that. These are great swelling words. But these are great swelling words of vanity, the Bible says. They are vain, right? They are of no use to anybody. They are of no use to anybody, right? If you go to a personality development course or you take a personality development course, you would gain more there than by listening to these false teachers, right? It's, uh, you know, a mix of what they preach is a mix of personality development, positive thinking, and all sorts of things. It's a confusion, you see. And they take it all together and use good words and fair speeches to put their message across. Great swelling words of vanity. Jude uses the same words. Look at uh, Jude 16. Jude verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Good words and fair speeches, great swelling words of vanity. That's how you identify false teachers. That's how you identify false teachers. I think you are not able to read here, so I'll take it out of here. Right, all these are great swelling words, right? Is that how he puts it? Great swelling words of vanity. I'm sure you have heard preachers who speak like this, right? They use these big words and... Uh, you know, they try to impress upon the minds of their hearers that they are listening to someone who is superior to them, who has superior knowledge, perhaps someone who has direct access to God, which the rest of them don't have. That kind of a picture is given to the people when they use these great swelling words of vanity. Then you have the other kind, the scholarly kind. Right, who use these great swelling words of vanity to make you feel that you have to depend on them to know what God has said in this book. These are the kind who make you feel the King James Bible is not good enough. It's not the preserved word of God. And it doesn't consist of the preserved words of God. I will tell you, they'll say, you know, by going to the Hebrew and the Greek, what the wording should be in the Bible. Great swelling words of vanity is what you find among these people. Uh, let me read to you something I came across, uh, written by someone I know, I will not take the name of course, but, uh, you know, a professor, a very experienced professor, right? So he's writing this, you know, uh, there are many articles that he has written, I've just randomly picked up a couple. He's talking about teachers, all right? He's talking about teachers. And he says, teachers are endowed with the noble task of imparting knowledge. They are truly committed with aspiration, perspiration and inspiration. Teaching is listed as one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. It is one's driving passion for the profession of teaching which makes a lasting 
I don't know what this word is, never heard it before. Impingement or impingment, I don't know what that is. The word teacher occurs 60 times. Where does it occur 60 times? God knows. Maybe the Bible probably, but he didn't mention that. Okay, the Bible, because he says the Gospels portray Jesus as a great teacher. There you have it. The liberal uh, nonsense of, de of, of the Lord Jesus Christ being a great teacher. Right, that's what they say. Many unsaved people accept Jesus Christ as a great teacher, but not as Lord and Savior. And here you have a quite liberal guy who says the same thing. Uh, he says, but look at the great swelling words of vanity here. The gospel portrays Jesus as a great teacher replete with great qualities. Among the gospel writers, Matthew seeks to attach a greater significance to the teaching of Jesus Christ. He made five major sections dealing with the teaching and discourse of Jesus Christ. All that stuff. It is, uh, it is intriguing to note that the teaching is given in the context of disciples, of the disciples coming to Jesus. And he talks about, uh, you know, disciples. And of course, they get into Greek, he says, you know, the word disciple comes from mathetes, which means student and learner. What is the need? You know, great swelling words. You have to show that you are a great teacher, like Jesus was a great teacher. All right. Look at this. So it says in keeping, keeping in line with the teacher's day observed today, I would like to highlight some salient qualities that signify Jesus as a thought provoking teacher. So he is a great teacher, then he is a thought-provoking teacher. <laughs> thought-provoking. Is that the idea you get when you listen to Jesus Christ? Or you read what Jesus preached? Thought-provoking preacher, he says, or teacher. And then he says, he is firstly, first point, he is an affable teacher. Jesus was an affable teacher. Whenever he saw the broken, the ignorant, the vulnerable, the needy, Jesus expressed his loving solidarity. So they have Jesus Christ preaching a social gospel. Right? He came to uplift the downtrodden. Right? Something like those outdated uh, theologies that people had before. Right? I, I even forget the names, but one of those is called the black theology I think if I'm not mistaken there was something else here in India but look at this Matthew 9 35 explicates Jesus's compassion in the context of Jesus seeing a crowd it is interesting to note that Jesus taught the way of God in every village and town it was Jesus's compassion which served as the core character who core character it is important to note a striking word used to speak about the compassion of Jesus. And uh, he, uh, you know, quotes a very difficult to pronounce Greek word. Because if it was in Greek, it would have been easier to read, but it's in English. The plural noun, splancha, refers to the seat of deep emotions inside. This suggests that Jesus expressed deeper and loving solidarity. Teachers ought to be compassionate or passionate towards the little ones and the vulnerable students. I wonder where they get all this from. He was an authoritative teacher, it says. And of course, he talks a lot of things there. He was an affirmative teacher, right? Affirmative. They love to use these words. He was, his speech was life affirming, right? Or, the contrary, they would say life negating. They love these big swelling words of vanity. Right? Uh, he says, it is true that the educational system disseminates a preponderance of knowledge. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's like you are trying to show how many words you have learned in the English language, right? It doesn't matter really. Uh, you know, whether you're making sense or not, but when people read it, they should think, oh, what a great learned man he is. Look at the language he uses. 
Of course, social justice is another thing that he talks about that Jesus advocated. Uh, my goodness, look at all these things. For Jesus, peace entails putting a top priority in seeking the welfare of others. Teachers need to imbibe these values so as to transmit them to the students. So the fourth point, Jesus was an action-infused teacher. Jesus accentuated the ethics of hearing and doing in his teaching. The epilogue of the Sermon on the, uh, Sermon on the Mount uh, you know, bring to the fore the imperativeness of praxis or action. Jesus translates his precept into practice. Oh my goodness. For Jesus, the disciples are to commit themselves to performative task. It is important to convert doctrine into action. Well, that's one thing that we agree with. Theory into pragmatism. Is that pragmatism? Pragmaticism. And belief into behavior. There is a need to share knowledge to build up lives. Oh, really? Share knowledge. That's it. You know, that's a great teacher. Sharing knowledge. Jesus came to share knowledge. He was a thought-provoking teacher, right? Uh, he preached a social gospel. He preached, uh, you know, justice for the poor and for the downtrodden and things like that. I wonder why, you know, why people try to do this with a clear conscience. Can they do this with a clear conscience? I don't know. Look at this. Another one from the same guy. COVID-19 pandemic continues to wreak pain, precarity and demise into human lives. We are precariously placed in the vicissitudes of life. We lost dear ones, friends, leaders around the globe. Uh, all that stuff, you know, he says, our lives totally confined to our houses, therefore, thereby restricting social mobility. Restricting social mobility instead of saying, you know, we are unable to go out. That's what he's saying. Restricting social mobility. In this context of vulnerability and social distancing, people tend to adopt a closed door mentality and all that. A mindset which is antithetical to a symbiotic life which seeks the well-being of others. <laughs> he talks about God's grace in this article, right? How God is gracious to everyone. And he talks about what is what he calls a theology of grace. So he says grace is the freeness of God's generosity. Well, okay. When we talk about the grace of God, it is not passive but active. In fact, grace further denotes the availability of God's power. Goes on and on and on. The latest approaches that take cue from the postmodern approach seem to disparage or nullify the hermeneutics of grace. This is contravenous to God's method of reaching out to the needy and vulnerable humanity. Always to do with society, you see. That's the liberal ecumenical agenda, right? All these things. That's what you find these people teaching. What we need in this pandemic situation is a grace-injected mindset. Grace-injected mindset. Oh my goodness. It is this generosity alone that can make a difference in this present precarity. All right, I won't bore you anymore with any of these quotes. But look at that. That's how. These people speak. They can't speak straight, you see. They can't use plain, simple language. They have to make a big show of their knowledge. And this is a, an excellent example of great swelling words of vanity. And this is the view they have about Jesus Christ, that he is a great teacher. I'm not saying this guy that I, uh, you know, just quoted uh, is a complete liberal. He is a liberal, but he does believe in uh, the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. I know that, right? So I know the guy personally. So I can tell you that he is born again himself and he preaches the gospel. But since he was educated in a liberal college, this is what you get out of him. This kind of stuff. So you have on one side these charismatics, these Pentecostals who use these great swelling words of vanity. 
good words and fair speeches. Then you have the other side, the liberals and the ecumenicals and the scholars. All these people love to use such fair speeches and good words. You might have a doubt in your mind. What does the Bible say in Titus chapter 2 and verse 8? Let us look at Titus chapter 2 and verse 8. <clears throat> it says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 8, uh, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Paul says that what we need as Christians is sound speech. Sound speech, correct? So you would say, well, some of these people who, who use such language are using sound speech. Now, I've just read, of course, I didn't read the whole articles, they're long articles. I just picked a, a, a few portions here and there and read to you, uh, uh, you know, a couple of articles. Nothing goes into the mind, you see. What is the point? Ultimately, after you read the whole thing, you would ask yourself, what was the point of all this? Well, I would have gone to the dictionary to look up a few words. I would have learned, added some words to my vocabulary. That's the best. What is the result of all this? What do I get? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Does it edify me? No. Does it make me smarter? No, it doesn't. It is of no benefit whatsoever to the Bible believer or to any Christian for that matter. That is not sound speech, you see. The, the sound speech that Paul is talking about here, Titus chapter 2 and verse 8, he says, sound speech that cannot be condemned. In other words, your sound speech should be a result of you believing sound doctrine. So when you speak wholesome words, right, that's the other expression that Paul uses, wholesome words, they build people up, they edify your hearers. That is sound speech, not just using flowery language, Shakespearean language in your prayers, right, like so many Christians do, they put a show when they pray. They love to put on a show when they pray. They want to make people think that they are very holy, firstly. Secondly, they want people to think, oh, look, uh, you know, what a close personal relationship this guy has with God. Look how he prays. Right? So they would use those kind of words you can make of. They are putting on a show. Right? They hold, uh, you know, uh, they want to impress. They want to be admired by people. They want people to think how great they are. So that's when you see them praying like that. You know, even the tone of their voice is such that, you know, you should think, oh, look how holy and pious and godly this man is. It's sad, but there are Christians who actually fall for this. Sound speech, they think, is speech that, uh, you know, firstly consists of very good language, flowery language, right? With great swelling words, good words and fair speeches. They think that's what it is. Secondly, they think sound speech means you never attack anyone. You never criticize anybody. You never judge anybody or their teachings. That is what sound speech is to most Christians, right? So they say sound speech is equal to never attack anybody right never criticize and never judge well this is another thing that we should talk about sometime judge judging right they say who are you to judge me don't judge anybody and all that stuff, they have their philosophies, they have their slogans, right, that they use. But you see, this is what they think is sound speech. But this is not what the Bible says is sound speech. If this is sound speech, then Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul and the rest of the Apostles like Peter and the others, never had sound speech. 
Let me show you. Let me show you a few examples. Let's start with Paul. Let's start with Paul. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at what Paul says about his own speech. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 10.10 10. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Okay, here we are talking about Paul. And he says that his speech is contemptible. That means those who hear his speech would have only contempt for how he speaks or the way he speaks. That's how Paul's speech was. He didn't have these good words and fair speeches. He never used these great swelling words. He never did. If you don't believe that, look at the same 2 Corinthians again. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 6. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been truly uh, made manifest among you in all things. Look at that. I, he says he is rude in speech. That's Paul's testimony about the way he spoke. Did you ever notice this? He says his speech is contemptible and rude, not Good words and fair speeches. He never ever used that. Paul never used that. In fact, even when he preached the gospel, let me show you this. I need to show you this because there is a bunch of Christians who think, you know, who think they are great intellectuals and apologists who are going to fight for what God knows for what they fight, right? But they are apologists. And the thing they focus on Firstly is language, right? So the way they speak, a good example would be Ravi Zacharias, the late Ravi Zacharias, right? Uh, do I think he was saved? I certainly think he was saved. But again, if you listen to him speak, what do you see? Fair speeches and good words. Language, right? Which really... Uh, enthralls the crowd that's the first thing the second thing is uh, a display of his intellect right his ability to understand various philosophies sometimes even some scientific matters right even speculative science and physics and all these things okay he tries to get uh, you know, uh, and he was smart, no doubt about that. Absolutely no doubt. I'm not saying uh, he was dumb. He certainly was not. His IQ would have been very high. Correct? So, you have men like him. And you have, in India especially, hundreds of thousands of wannabe Ravi Zacharias. <laughs> I like the way that word ends when we talk about these people in the plural. All these guys, you know, imitating him and trying to be Ravi Zacharias, trying to act like him, talk like him, trying to, uh, you know, they make themselves believe they are intellectuals and then they try to make others believe that they are intellectuals. Defending the faith. What faith? What faith, man, are you trying to defend? You, none of you fellows believe that God has preserved all his words in one book. If this book is not being defended, what is the purpose of apologetics? Oh, we are defending the Christian faith, earnestly contending for the faith and all that. Be ready to give an answer to all those who ask you for that reason, for the hope that is in you and all that. These people are trying to build a huge structure without a foundation, without believing God has Preserved all his words in one book for the whole world. One book and that's the King James Bible of course. They go out to defend the faith. Where does the faith come from? Their faith comes from what the scholars say your faith is. So they try to defend that. 
So you find them getting into arguments with atheists. They get into debates with uh, scientists, right, who are mostly atheists, not all, but many of them, uh, you know, debating evolution and all these kind of things. They debate people of other religions. And most of the times it's pathetic when these guys go to debate, you know, they, they lose, they clearly lose those debates. Especially when they debate the Muslims, right? These guys don't have the capacity to debate those guys. Because those guys mostly have extremely stupid arguments and it's difficult to refute stupid, uh, such stupid arguments. That's right, it, it is sometimes. So they go there and they fall prey to their, uh, you know, and the thing is most of those Muslim scholars who debate these Christian fellows don't use the same kind of fair speeches and good words. Did you ever notice that? They use street language, street tricks, right? They're smart. Those guys are smart. They know how to uh, defeat a person in a debate. They don't need all this big language, flowery language, but our fellows think that's what is the most important thing. So look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and verse 17. 1 Corinthians 1 17. Look at what Paul says. For Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words. That's what these fellows try to do. Not with uh, wisdom of words. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Paul says. I don't use these. To preach the gospel, not with uh, the wisdom of words. His speech is contemptible and rude, not, note that, not with wisdom of words. When he preaches the gospel to the unsaved, not with wisdom of words. How does he preach? Through the demonstration of the Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how he preached. Not with wisdom of words. Lest, he says, the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. That's what these people are doing when they use these good words and fair spe uh, speeches to preach the gospel. They're making the gospel of Christ of none effect. Because they're using wisdom of words. We have been talking about Ravi Zacharias. Right, I had a bunch of CDs, right, which I listened to when I was a young Christian, a bunch of them, probably more than a hundred or, or maybe much more than that. I've read most of the books that he had written. And, uh, you know, when you listen to these CDs, uh, he, uh, you know, there are speeches that he's giving in very big universities all over the world, like ha Harvard University or Oxford or any of those very big ones, Cambridge University and all that. At the end of every speech that he gives, you know what he gets? He gets a standing ovation from a crowd that is, uh, you know, uh, seemingly antagonistic to the Christian faith, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the cross, to the Bible. This man gives a speech and they stand up and clap for him. You know why? They are totally flawed and impressed with the way he presents his speech, his language, right? His wit, he was very funny, extremely. I love listening to the jokes, you know, made by Ravi Zacharias. His, his wit, his logic, his knowledge, right? The way he presents all these things. The way he captivates his crowd, an excellent orator. That's why they stand up and give him an, uh, a standing ovation. Not because they're saying, oh, glory to God, I'm saved today by listening to Ravi Zacharias. Glory to God. No, nothing like that. Absolutely nothing like that. This is how it is, brethren. Uh, Paul never used these things. His speech was contemptible and rude and never with uh, the wisdom of words did he preach the gospel. Look at, uh, in fact, look at how Paul spoke. Look at this. Look at Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. 
and we'll read uh, verses 1 to 3, Acts chapter 23, verses 1 to 3. Paul was arrested and uh, the leaders of the Sanhedrin and the temple are there before the Roman uh, authority and they are talking. And this is what uh, the Bible says. And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. So when Paul said this, Ananias, the high priest, said, smite him on the mouth, beat him on the mouth. Look at Paul's reaction to that, verse 3. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. Paul is not the kind of person these false teachers portray him to be. They try to make you believe that Paul was a great theologian, firstly, like these people, right? His work was to write theology books like these people did. No, Paul was not like that. He was a street preacher. He was a soul winner. He was a church planter. He was an evangelist. He was a missionary. He was a hellfire and damnation preacher. And he had a temper. Look at that. It says, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, he says, to the high priest. And then, of course, he says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was the high priest, right? He was just like us. But look at that. He was rude. He was, his speech was contemptible. And he didn't mince words. Not at all. And they make you think Paul is like them. Paul used fair speeches and, uh, you know, good words. No, he didn't. He absolutely didn't. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. The reason I'm showing you all this is to make you understand that the apostles or the Lord Jesus Christ never spoke the way these people speak. These false teachers speak with good words and fair speeches. And sound speech is not never attacking or never criticizing or never judging. That's exactly what Peter, Paul and the other apostles and the Lord Jesus Christ did. They attacked, they criticized, they judged. Look at uh, Titus chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. Paul is saying this. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. He's quoting their own poet or somebody, right? A prophet. He quoted their own prophet, who said, These people, this whole race of people are liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. What should Paul say like a decent Christian? That prophet was so wrong, he is so uh, insensitive to the feelings of people and all that. No, that's not what he said. This witness is true. In other words, Paul is saying these Christians are all liars, evil beasts and slow bellies. Wow. Sound speech if you ever heard one. And look at what he says. Therefore rebuke them sharply. That they may be sound in the faith. Rebuke them sharply, he says. Nowadays, if you rebuke people in the church, they get offended because they are thin-skinned. You see, they can't take it. They feel ashamed. Oh, how can the pastor do this? We are quitting this church. They don't want to be rebuked. But you see how Paul spoke? Paul's idea of sound speech is certainly not... The, uh, you know, uh, the idea of these false teachers that you have today who use good words and fair speeches. <clears throat> Let's look at how Jesus Christ spoke, right? We saw how Paul spoke. We'd, there could be many more examples, but we will just pick a few, even with the Lord Jesus Christ, just a few. Now, again, you must remember modern preachers make it look like Jesus is that Great teacher, thought-provoking teacher. He preached a social gospel. They love to call him uh, the lowly Nazarene. 
the lowly Nazarene, or they love to call him the lowly Galilean. A lowly Galilean, right? He was meek and mild. Their idea of meek and mild is, you know what it is? Their idea of meek and mild and the lowly, uh, lowly Nazarene is that Jesus Christ was a sissy and effeminate. That's what their idea of Jesus is. He's a sissy and an effeminate like themselves. That's how these people are nowadays. They're sissies, you see. They're nothing like the Apostle Paul or the Lord Jesus Christ, though they think they are. No. So they tried to make Paul and Jesus just like them when they were not. Absolutely not. This is the last thing about Jesus or Paul that you would see. Never were they sissies or effeminate. Never. Look at uh, uh, John chapter 8 and verse 44. The Gospel of John chapter 8 and verse 44. It says, this is how Jesus spoke, by the way, right? Sound speech. It says, never attack, never criticize, never judge. Look at what Jesus says in John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Wow, what sound speech. Jesus is saying, you are the devil's children. He says, you are murderers. And liars. And he's saying that to their faces, you see. He's talking to these guys. And he says this to their face. He says, you are the children of the devil. You are murderers and you are liars, he says. And the lusts of, the, uh, of your father you will do. What sound speech. You can go through and read all the sound speech uh, used by the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Let me give you a few more examples. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And uh, look, let's begin with verse 13. Matthew 23 and verse 13. Again, he says this to their face. Right? He's not speaking from a pulpit. He's not uh, speaking on radio or on YouTube like this. Right? He's not writing a book. No. He's talking to them face to face. And this lowly Galilean, lowly Nazarene, right? This thought-provoking great teacher. What does he say? But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. He says, hypocrites, directly to their face. You won't find these modern uh, smooth talkers ever use such words when they preach. Look at verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. He says, you hypocrites, you will be damned. Wow, what sound speech. Verse 5. Verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. He's saying you are children of hell. Children of hell, he says. Again, what sound speech. He lowly Galilean, he never attacked anybody, never criticized anybody. Right? He was always kind and generous and all that. Now look at uh, verse 16. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. He calls them blind guides. 
What else? What are the other words he uses in his sound speech? Uh, look at uh, verse 17. Ye fools and blind. Wow. Fools. Blind. Can you imagine any of these modern preachers use this kind of language? For whether is greater the gold of the temple that sanctified the gold. So this is the kind of language he uses. Look at verse 27. I'll show you a couple more examples and move forward. Look as, uh, at verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but, within, uh, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Again, he uses the same words that Paul used, right? Or Paul used the same words that Jesus used. You whited sepulchre, he says. That's what Paul said to the high priest, Ananias. Now look at verse 33. Verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wow, serpents... He says, wipers, <laughs> what choice words. And, uh, you know, he talks about how they'll be damned to hell. Can you imagine Joel Austin saying, if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will die in your sins and you'll be damned to hell. No, he uses good words and fair speeches. Right, he's a Typical wolf in sheep's clothing. Look at what it says about the apostles. And I would like to say this to all the wannabe Ravi Zacharias. Look at uh, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Look at verse 13. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus look at this this is what it says about the Bible says about the apostles they were unlearned and ignorant oh that's not what they want to be called oh look at the list of degrees I have uh, accumulated. Right? Look at all the master's degrees, all the PhDs I have and all that. I'm not unlearned, I'm not ignorant. And uh, you know, it's very sad sometimes to see how these Christians, right, who think they, they can serve the Lord Jesus Christ well, if they become good apologists. So the, what do they do? They get too deep into those subjects that they are trying to refute. So whether it's science or philosophy or religion, whatever it is, they get too deep into that. And you know what they don't have? They don't have what these men had. It says they had boldness firstly, right? In the face of persecution, they preached Christ boldly. And it is said that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That's the most important thing, being with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you don't find among these great intellectuals and scholars. They, are not with, they have not been with Jesus. And they love to make you believe that Paul was like one of them. So they always say, look how learned Paul was. God used Paul more than any other apostle because he was the most educated and learned man. In the words of Paul himself, more than anything else, Paul was a Bible believer. Right? If you don't believe that, later on you can go back and read. Uh, let's see, Acts 22, I think. Uh, I'll see if I can find that verse. Or maybe you can look it up. He says, I'm in the, or maybe it's in chapter 23, probably, I don't know. 
but he says, you know, that uh, I'm in this condition because I have believed all that the law and the prophets uh, have written, I have believed everything. So I'm in this position, in this condition, because I'm a Bible believer. He never, ever, even if he was highly educated, he never, uh, you know, showed it. He never used it. Look at what he says. Never with the wisdom of words, he says, did I preach the gospel. Because that would make the cross of Christ of none effect. So, sound speech is not the same as fair speech. You must get this straight. Sound speech could involve attacking, criticizing, and judging false teachers. And that's what Jesus did. That's what Paul did. That's what the apostles did. All right. So uh, sound speech is not the same as fair speech. The false teachers use fair speech in which they never attack anybody, never criticize anybody, never judge anybody. Because they don't care about anybody. All they care for is the money in your pocket, the money in your banks. That's what they want. And you would see if it's the charismatic uh, false teachers who use good words and fair speeches, they're all multi-millionaires, right? With big mansions and security and a fleet of cars and uh, airplanes and all those th things. If they do this, they'll never get all that. Then you have the other extreme, these scholars who use good words and fair speeches. They do that to make the body of Christ dependent on them. It's their ego, their pride that is being fed. When the whole uh, you know, body of Christ depends on them for the words of God. Now going back there, going back to Romans chapter 16. It says uh, in verse 8, uh, sorry, verse 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. The result of using good words and fair speeches is deception. Deception. Right, that's the motive. Now, why do they deceive? For what purpose do they deceive? Because they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, right? Because they serve their own belly. That's why. That's why, right? They do this to deceive and to steal your money. Uh, let me quickly show you a few verses and close. I didn't expect this Bible study to be so long, but uh, I thought I'll be making a series of short Bible studies, but I think we already crossed one. I'll close quickly here, as quickly as possible. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the, uh, into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works." So you see the deception is firstly that they transform themselves into the ministers of Christ when they are actually the ministers of the devil. Right? They are ministers of the devil. It doesn't, you know, but the body of Christ thinks, oh, they are such good, godly men. Oh, look at Benny Hinn, how godly he is. All right? Or look at some other guy, you know, look at John MacArthur Jr. Oh, look how godly and pious he is. You have all these guys, all the extremes, you see. All of them are good godly scholars, good godly men and women and all that stuff. But these are ministers of Satan, instruments of Satan. Uh, look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, uh, 
and through covetousness shall they with feigned words. Look at that again. The emphasis the Holy Spirit puts on the kind of words these people use. Good words, fair words, feigned words here in verse 3. Through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. They serve their own belly. So in order to do that, they make merchandise. Merchandise of you, Christian. They want to get your money. They want to get your money. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. You see that? They use feign words. They make merchandise of you. How do they do that, right? They make merchandise of you by using feign words. That's how they do that. That's how they do that. Uh, look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6. Look at what these fellows do. And this is something that you see all the time. Sadly, so many Christian families destroyed because of false teachers. Look at 2 Timothy 3 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. You see that? They are like snakes. They creep into houses. And who are their targets? Who are their targets? Look at this. And lead captive silly women. Look how Paul uses sound speech. He says silly women. You say that now in the church. A bunch of women are going to get offended and persuade their families that this pastor is a very ungodly man and God has shown them that they should not attend this church anymore. Right? But look at Paul. He says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. That's the way they work. That's the way they get your money. They get to the women in your house. And most of the times, the man, unfortunately again, is not bothered with the Bible, with Jesus Christ, with prayer. Even if he's saved, he's a lukewarm, backslidden Christian. He's living to just make enough money, right? So he's not bothered about church, nothing. So he let his wife do what she wants with uh, these things, with religious things and with which church to attend, which preacher to listen to. You know, he doesn't want to have anything to do with that. Let her do what she wants. As long as she leaves me alone, she is free to do what she wants. But you see, these fellows creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins and lusts. And the, the result would be the destruction of that family. Destruction of that family. They serve their own belly as we have seen. You know, their main thing is money. And look at what the Bible says about this very quickly. Right in Romans 16, 18, we've already seen they do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They serve their own belly. Look at Philippians 3, 18 and 19. Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Philippians 3, 18 and 19. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. They serve their own belly because uh, <coughs> because whose God is their belly. Their God is their belly. They serve their belly because their belly is their God. Right, so they make money to feed themselves, to enjoy, right, to enjoy the pleasures of sin, the pleasures of this life. Look at First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 5. That's why you have a bunch of prosperity gospel preachers nowadays. Look at First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 5. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Paul says in First Timothy chapter 6 verse 5, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Withdraw thyself. Because they think to have gain 
is godliness. They equate gain. If you make money, you're a godly man. If you're poor, you're not godly. You're not spiritual. Gain is godliness. Paul says, withdraw yourself from such people. You hear a prosperity gospel preacher, you avoid that person. You withdraw yourself because for him, his God is his own belly. His own belly. Look at 2 Peter 2.14. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14. These are all important verses. You know, I'm not going to explain these verses, but you can note them down. Maybe later study them by yourself. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Look at that. Peter says they are cursed. Because they beguile unstable souls. You see that silly women and unstable souls. Men or women, it doesn't matter. They are unstable and they take advantage of these unstable souls and these silly women. Right? You should look at the faces of people listening to preachers like Joel Austin or Joyce Mayer or any Creflo Dollar, any of these big charismatic guys. Oh, you should see they'll be beaming, you know, these people listening to them thinking, oh, look how wonderful the preaching is. What a great man of God. What a great woman of God. Right? They would listen to a devil like Paula White and they would sit there with their faces beaming with admiration for that witch. Right, that's what I heard she is, and I'm sure she is. Look at that. They think gain is godliness. It's sad that Christians fall for this. You know why Christians fall for these prosperity gospel preachers? Because these Christians are greedy for gain. And they have been convinced that gain is godliness. If God blesses me with a lot of wealth, right, that means I'm godly. That's why God blessed me. Let me tell you this, I'll close with this, a true prophet, right, not a false one, a, 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 a teacher or preacher of sound doctrine, he is a man, uh, you know, who engages in a lot of contention and he's cursed by society, he's cursed by the people, even Christians sometimes, not by God, but by people, they hate him, they hate him. Right? And they would call him a false teacher. They would call him someone who brings in sedition among God's people. Right? Divisions among God's people. Right? Their favorite slogan is doctrines divide. Yeah, that's true. So what are you going to do? Throw doctrine out is their answer. Look at a true prophet. This is how a true prophet is. Look at Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 10. Jeremiah is saying this about himself. Woe is me, my mother, that thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. Look at that. He says, I, your son, am a man of contention and a man of strife to the whole earth. Because he was a prophet to the nations, right? I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doth curse me. You see that? That's because he spoke the truth. The whole nation went to the dogs at that time. He was the only true prophet of God who preached the truth. And he was put in prison. He was put in a ditch, right? He was uh, a prisoner of the king. And look at that. He's saying, look at me. I speak the truth and this is what I get. Strifes and contentions and people cursing me all the time. But that's a true prophet. That's a true Bible-believing preacher, Bible-believing teacher. And that's how Jesus Christ was. That's how Paul was. Right? And that's how all the apostles were. 
We don't have the time to look at all the, uh, you know, the prophets, but you think about it. All the prophets of the Old Testament, most of them at least, all the apostles of the New Testament, and then the Lord Jesus Christ himself. All of them, you could say, they were despised and rejected of men. They were men of sorrows, acquainted with grief, just like their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Rejected of men. Right? Even though a multitude followed Jesus Christ, right? that was for, for a very short period of time. And then the same, many of those fellows shouted, crucify him. So they were never popular preachers. They, they were never accepted. Right? You know why? Because they were never politically right in their speech. They never used good words and fair speeches. They, were never, they uh, never were diplomatic in their speech. Right? They were not the kind of people portrayed by the liberal ecumenical preachers today. They were not like that at all. They were radical firebrands. That's what they were. And they never minced words. Doesn't mean like, you know, uh, that they had some personal things with people and they would fight with them and for personal reasons and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. No. They did it for the sake of the gospel, for the truth, for the words of God. That's what they stood for and fought for. And that's the reason why they were, uh, you know, uh, like how Jeremiah says, men of contention and strife, men who were cursed by all the others. You cannot take a false teacher lightly. Remember what Paul says again in the text that we started with Romans uh, chapter 16 verse 18. He said, uh, you know, avoid them, he says. Do not fellowship with them, the Bible says. Do not bid them Godspeed. Mark such people and kick them out. Do not encourage them. Do not uh, have fellowship with them. Beware of false teachers. Beware of wolves in sheep's clothing.